My name is Rosanna Yun. Uh, uh, I am the Director of Operations for the Genome Foundation. Um, I appreciate you all coming out and joining my talk today. Uh, my first contribution to the Genome Project was in 1998, and I have been an employee of the foundation since 2006. I did grow up in the New York area, so I apologize in advance if I talk too fast. I'm trying on working on that. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the Genome Foundation then and now. So let's start with a quick overview of what the Genome Foundation is. Uh, we are a US 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Uh, that means we are stewards of the Genome Project and we are uh, the legal and financial entity that represents that project. Uh, we are overseen by a board of directors who are elected by the membership. And the GNOME Foundation is, uh, has paid staff to keep things running. Traditionally, the GNOME Foundation has taken a supporting role, uh, which means we work towards making sure that the GNOME project succeeds. So let's set the scene here. Uh, we're going back in time. Uh, it's the mid 90s, the 1990s. Um, Microsoft was everywhere. If you owned a personal computer, chances were you are running Windows 98. Uh, technical workstations used to be dominated by Unix, but Windows NT was making inroads into that market because it was cheaper and easier for people to understand and use. Linux was starting to be a viable Unix replacement and desktops were popping up left and right as people tried to fill that niche. In August of 1997, the GNOME project was started to create a free desktop using a free toolkit. By free, I obviously mean free and open source, but at this point in time, that term had not been coined yet. Uh, by December of 1997, Red Hat had created the Red Hat Advanced Development Labs, where they hired a handful of folks to work full time on GNOME. Other companies followed suit. And moving forward a little bit, in March of 1999, GNOME 1.0 was released. It was not a success. Uh, if you were around back then or have heard stories, it was not definitely not one of our better releases. In a rush to get that release out the door, it had not been properly tested. A huge push followed uh, for improvements and stability. By October, a stable version of GNOME was released and it was called October GNOME. Uh, this, re this release was relatively usable. I started using GNOME as my primary desktop at this point and have been using it ever since. The following year in February, Slashdot.org slash dot announced their first ever Beanie Awards. Uh, they had a lot of different awards uh, from the silly to the serious. These prizes were awarded based on votes from the general public. The top prize was for most improved open source project and the GNOME project won this award, mainly because people had seen so much improvement since the 1.0 release. This reward, this award came with three, thir came with a $30,000 prize money package. About a month later in March, we had our first GNOME conference. It started off with someone at a local university in Paris inviting a few folks to come and talk to the students. The developers that were invited thought it might be nice to get more folks together and hold some workshops. They talked some companies into sponsoring flights for developers and they were able to get over 40 contributors to show up. The first Squatic conference included contributor, contributors from Red Hat, Sun Microsystems, and IBM. So during this first Squatic, uh, some of the folks got together to socialize in the evenings after all their work was done. 
and they would hang out at a local cafe. And while there, they would start discussing what issues they thought were keeping GNOME back. Some of the issues that they discussed included the fact that companies wanted to support GNOME financially, but they didn't really have a good way to do it. Paying developers is helpful, yes, but that doesn't help with coordinating a free, desk, a free software project that has developers for, and viewpoints from different companies. Companies wanted a single source to talk to and deal with about all things GNOME. GNOME needed a way to distribute funds. We already had that $30,000 in prize money, and it sounded like companies wanted to give more, but who would decide where and how this money would be spent? We needed someone or something to hold onto the GNOME assets, and we needed a way to make sure GNOME keeps going, regardless of whether any individual contributor is still around. So the solution these folks at the cafe came up with was to create the GNOME Foundation. The GNOME Foundation is able to invoice and receive funds from interested companies. Uh, the F GNOME Foundation is a non-commercial point of contact for companies to work with. We also act as a mediator between some of these companies. The foundation can plan and finance hack fests and conferences and invite all developers to attend. The GNOME Foundation can hold copyrights, trademarks, and other assets, including bank accounts. Having the project tied to the foundation means that it isn't tied to any single person. So what is the GNOME Foundation? We are a 501c3 nonprofit corporation based in California in the United States. That means that donors in the United States can make tax deductible donations to the GNOME Foundation. Otherwise, a 501c3 is run a lot like a for-profit corporation, except that our shareholders are the general public. Next, I will be talking about the structure of the GNOME Foundation. The base of, our, of the GNOME Foundation is our members. Memberships are for individuals only. Companies cannot become foundation members. In order to become a member, you have to be a GNOME contributor. Memberships are valid for two years and they can be renewed. Uh, foundation members can run for the board of directors, they can vote in elections, and they can suggest referenda. Foundation members are also first in line to, for travel funding to GNOME events and other sponsorships. So in the year 2000, we had 372 members of the GNOME Foundation. Anyone who contributed was eligible to become a member. Folks with CVS access were told they could add themselves to the membership roster. Those were simpler times. And while it said any contribution, anyone without CVS access, that was our repository at the time, had to jump through extra hoops to join. So it was mostly developers in the membership roles. Today, we have 219 members. Membership requires a non-trivial amount of contributions. Application form is found online at that URL on the slide. This is the same form that needs to be filled out for renewals. The form explicitly welcomes applicants who have contributed code, translations, advocacy, infrastructure, outreach, and documentation. Uh, we, la we added this last statement because for years, people who did not contribute code, but did contribute in other areas, did not feel that they could be members, and we wanted all contributors to know that they are welcome. We also currently have 64 emeritus members. Emeritus members were once full foundation members who still want to be part of the community, 
but they do not meet the contribution criteria to renew their membership. Emeritus members cannot vote, but they can keep their blogs and their gnome.org email alias. If an emeritus member starts con contributing again, they can reapply for full membership. Next, I want to talk about our board of directors. Our board of directors is made up of volunteers elected from the foundation membership to steer the foundation. Uh, directors on the board are serve on the board as individuals and not as an employee of the company that they may be working for. Even so, our bylaws, it is explicitly uh, mentioned that no more than one third of the board of directors at any one time can be employed at the same company. So the board of directors originally had 11 seats. It turns out that that was too many for a foundation our size. In 2002, we decreased that number to seven seats, and that's what it's been ever since. Originally, the length of the term was one year, and we had annual elections for every seat. Last year, we changed the length of term to two years. The seats are staggered so that each year about half the seats open up for elections. As an employee of the foundation, I have to say that this change was so very welcome. Prior to that, I would stress it out personally every year around election time about the possibility of having a whole new board with completely new directors. Continuity is a very good thing. Meetings originally were held monthly. And if you notice, they're now held monthly. However, it hasn't always been the case. It actually went to biweekly and then weekly, and then back to bi-weekly, and only in this past year has it gone back up to monthly meetings. It's really interesting how that's a, a cyclical process. This is our current board of directors in the Gnome Foundation. They come from five different countries and three continents. Uh, speaking of cyclical, I want to point out Federico, who's there at the bottom right, he was one of the founders of the GNOME project, and he was also an original board member in 2000. This is his sixth term on the board. He's come on and off a few times, and we're very grateful that he's spending time there on the board now. Uh, the other board members, some of them have uh, been board members for, for quite as well as, uh, quite, uh, excuse me, for quite a while as well. Uh, and we do have two members of the board who are new this year. So it's great to have new blood and have continuity. Beyond the board, we also have committees. Committees are an extension of the board of directors. Our bylaws stipulate how committees can be formed or dissolved, but does not name any committees by name. Committees are created by the board as needed to fulfill board duties. Every committee and every member of each committee needs to be reconfirmed annually by the board. Each committee also has a director from the board on it to act as a liaison between the committee and the board. The Gnome Foundation started off with just one committee, the Elections Committee, and they were there to handle the election of the original board of directors. As we grew, so did our number of committees. This is our list of our current committees. Uh, the election committee became the membership and elections committee. They now also process membership applications and renewals. We also have the release team who handle the GNOME releases twice a year. The travel committee who processes applications for travel sponsorship to GNOME events. The compensation committee who does the research and meets to propose the compensation package for our executive director, the code of conduct committee who handles code of conduct issues, and the circle committee, which is our newest committee. Their job is to help coordinate and invite into the conversation the software beyond core GNOME release that is still dependent or otherwise associated with GNOME. Some committees we have had through the years were more ephemeral. They were created for a single task and then disbanded once the task was done. 
For example, uh, a few years back, we had a hiring committee formed to help with the hiring process for our executive director. And once he was hired, the committee was disbanded. The GNOME, committee, the GNOME Foundation also has staff to keep things running. Uh, staff consists of both employees and independent contractors. We all work remotely. We have no office. Uh, the staff helps the foundation by providing continuity and fill in any gaps necessary to keep GNOME going strong. When we first started in 2000, we had one employee, the executive director. Now we have eight and a half people on staff. And that, that there is me, the director of operations. Remember when I said earlier that companies aren't allowed to have foundation memberships? The advisory board is where they can take part. They can help, to, uh, the, the advisory board is where they can take part in helping shape GNOME. Our advisory board is made up of a combination of interested companies and other nonprofit organizations. The advisory board meets periodically with the board of directors to give non-binding strategic advice. They don't have voting authority. Member companies pay an annual fee. Nonprofits usually have free memberships. This is a list of the advisory board members in 2000 and today. Note that there has been a lot of change. The only two entities that have been on the advisory board since the very beginning are the Free Software Foundation and Red Hat. I'd be remiss if I did not mention the role of teams in the GNOME Foundation. While teams are essential to the success of GNOME, unlike committees, they are not extensions of the board. They are unofficial groups who work on the GNOME project. Originally, they were completely volunteer led but as we have gained staff, some have become staff led to ensure continuity. And here we have a list of some of our long running teams, uh, which include our design team, our engagement team, our localization team, our documentation team, and various conference planning teams. Next, I will be talking about some of the programs that the GNOME Foundation does. conferences. We don't just give talks at conferences like I am doing right now. And we also run booths at conferences. But GNOME also runs conferences for our contributors and users. We use these conferences to share our work and plan for future releases. Additionally, it is an opportunity for local communities to learn about GNOME. As I mentioned in the beginning, the first GNOME conference was Guadalajara in 2000. We have, had, we have held it annually ever since. This picture on the left is, was from the boat party in Paris. I was at the first Guadalajara in Paris, but I wasn't in the picture. Uh, I was a lot younger then, and we didn't have a code of conduct at the time. I didn't feel comfortable going to a social event and being the only female in the room. Nowadays, we do have a code of conduct and we do have uh, more diversity in our conferences. Guadic is also where we hold our annual general meeting. The E in Guadic used to stand for Europe. As you can see on the map on the right, the blue pins on this map show where all the Guadics have taken place. Now Guadic is no longer an acronym. We strongly believe that the locations of our conferences give us the opportunity to have GNOME outreach in those areas. And that being the case, we are trying to move outside of Europe and throughout the world. We had originally planned for Guadalajara this year to, be, to take place in Mexico, but unfortunately, pandemic, so everything went online. We're hoping to be able to hold it there next year though. And if you're free next year, 
during the summer and want to go to Mexico, we would love to have you at Guadec. The GNOME Asia Conference has also, has also been around for over a decade. Uh, you can see by the red pins here on the map where they have been held. Uh, the Linux App Summit is a conference that we started and now co-host with KDE. I couldn't fit that on the map, uh, but, but LAS has been held in Portland, Denver, and Barcelona, and the fourth instance is coming up next month. As I was just saying, the uh, Linux App Summit and the next GNOME Asia are both taking place in November of this year. Uh, they are both online conferences, and if you are interested in learning more about the Linux app space or about GNOME in general, the links for registration are listed on the slides. In addition, if you have a talk related to GNOME that you want to give, uh, the call for abstracts for GNOME Asia is still open, and I'm sure they would, we would love to hear what you have to say. Hackfests. Hackfests are opportunities for contr contributors to get together and sprint. The GNOME Foundation helps with coordination and can sponsor travel and venue costs. Uh, here is a list of a variety of Hackfests that have been held the last two years, though I should note that we have not had any Hackfests since February because of the pandemic. On this list are Hackfests like uh, GTK, Documentation Hackfest, GNOME plus Rust. We've actually had two of those in the past two years. Uh, a Parental Controls Hackfest, Board of Directors Planning Hackfest, a Fractal Hackfest, a G Streamer Hackfest, GNOME Photos Hackfest, a Developer Center Hackfest, Pipewire Hackfest, Design Tooling Hackfest, and Engagement Hackfest. I apologize if I've forgotten any. We have we try and have as many as we can. Outreach. Outreach is an important part of the programs we deliver. Uh, I've already mentioned before that one of the reasons we move our conferences around is to generate outreach in new local communities. Beyond that, we are also currently running the Coding Education Challenge. The goal of the Coding Education Challenge is to devise creative new ways to promote free and open source software to coders in high school and college. Uh, this challenge is currently in phase two, and we have 20 teams working hard on their proposals. It's really exciting, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what they have to, and what they come up with. We also participate in internship programs through, through Google Summer of Code and Outreachy. Occasionally, we will also run an internship in-house uh, and that depends on funding and what uh, fundraising we have been able to do. The University Outreach Initiative is a new program that aims to create a bond between educational institutions and the GNOME community. We have some community members active in universities working on making that happen. So those are the foundation, the, uh, the GNOME Foundation's top three program categories at the moment, uh, outreach, uh, conferences, and hackfests. So next, I want to talk about some highlights from our history. The GNOME Outreach Program for Women. Uh, we noticed uh, in the early 2000s when looking at our applicants for our Google Summer of Code internship program that they were all males and we wanted to change that. Uh, we started with an initial round in 2006 with three interns. That went well, but there were some pieces missing. In 2010, we rebooted this program and we made some changes. Uh, we would run two rounds a year to match with summer in both Northern and Southern hemispheres. If an applicant was eligible for Google Summer of Code as well, we would help them submit their application through there first. Internship, internships could be for other areas other than coding. So we tended to have lots of uh, translators and 
uh, documentation internships in, in the outreach program for women. Uh, the GNOME outreach program for women was a success beyond our wildest dreams. So much so that I personally couldn't keep up and it was my job to work the back office to make sure it was running. The program grew beyond what we at the GNOME Foundation could offer. So in 2015, the program rebranded itself to Outreachy and moved to the Software Freedom Conservancy. We still participate in the program, but we no longer help with the running day to day. So trademarks and other assets. Part of being uh, a foundation of uh, the representation of the GNOME project means that uh, part of the GNOME Foundation's responsibilities is to protect our assets. If you remember from the committee slide, we talked about the circle committee. That committee is there to help applications that aren't part of the core GNOME release, but part of our bigger ecosystem work with GNOME in ways that do not harm our trademarks. They do other things as well, but that is part of why they exist. Trademark battle with Groupon. Uh, in early 2014, we all learned that Groupon, or the foundation learned, the GNOME Foundation learned that Groupon was launching a point of sale device and, and planning on calling it Genome and spelling it G-N-O-M-E. They had uh, an initial filing of 10 trademarks all, variation, all variations on the word gnome or the letter G. We were told it would cost upwards of $10,000 to fight, to fight each one. That's a lot of money for a small nonprofit. Our lawyer attempted to talk with them, but they didn't really engage. Instead, they filed for 18 more trademarks. Our, advise, our lawyer advised us we needed to start thinking about fundraising to fund this fight. So we started a fundraiser and we sent out a plea. The free software community was amazing. So I personally get an email every time we get a donation. I filter those emails so as to not clutter my inbox. However, we had set up a new address for this fundraiser and I hadn't set up a filter yet or turned off notifications for it. So that first night, my phone kept buzzing on and on with more donations. It was such an awesome feeling knowing that the greater free software and free and open source community was there for us. Groupon got the message. Within days, Groupon withdrew all their trademark applications. The takeaway from that story is we are grateful to have excellent pro bono lawyers and that the free and open source community had our backs. So, segue from that to the patent dispute we had. Last year, the GNOME Foundation was sued for patent infringement for over one of our applications. We didn't think that the lawsuit had merit but patent suits are very expensive to fight. With the help of some excellent pro bono lawyers, we agreed to a settlement where the suit was dismissed and Rothschild Patent Imaging granted release and covenants for the entire Rothschild portfolio of patents and to, uh, yeah, for the entire Rothschild portfolio of patents to any software released under an OSI approved license. So that's any free software with uh, open source initiative approved license. Um, the takeaway from this story is we are once again really grateful to have excellent pro bono lawyers and we want the greater free and open source community to know that we have their backs as well. So looking ahead, Looking ahead at the issues uh, that we, the foundation is facing today. Uh, as long as this pandemic is still around, we need to find alternatives to having in-person hackfests. Because of time zones and coordination issues, online hackfests tend not to work very well and we are missing those short bursts that push our project forward. 
fundraising. It's been somewhat harder to do fundraising during a pandemic. Um, I'm sure that's the case with many nonprofits, so we're probably not alone here. Recruiting and maintaining a healthy volunteer base. Uh, that's something we're always working on improving. Uh, and I'm sure that every free software community can feel that uh, what, what we mean by that and, and are trying to do the same. And obviously our grand goal is to make GNOME great and accessible to everyone. So this is a photo montage of our Aquatic attendees this year. We couldn't do a group photo since it was a virtual conference. So we had folks send in a photo and we put this together. Thanks for listening to my talk today. I hope you found it informative.